Okay, my friends, we're finally getting somewhere. Now they're looking into nucleophilic substitution. And the reactions that they always show, that they have seen so far, have been in the laboratory. So they do this and they say, oh, look, we changed this to that. Well, that's fine. Now, biochemical, bio, biology ones are going to be observed. And that's what, I, that's what I work on. And I've been working on it for 10 years. Now, Finally, let's take a look at a few examples of nucleophilic substitution in a biological content where bones turn to stone. And that's nucleophilic substitution. That's all it is. This is what I've been saying for years now. This just came out a month or so ago. Now, all of the principles we have learned so far still apply to these biochemical reactions, but in addition, we need to consider the roles of enzymes and catalysts. Exactly. That's the bacteria. Bacteria create enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts. Catalysts break down products, and we're going to talk about that in a second, because these really literally create chemistry, the, the bacteria. And I'll show you that. I can absolutely prove it. All right. Now, this came out a couple of years ago, three years or so ago. Bacteria produce gold by digesting toxic metals. Well, everything you take into your body comes in the form of who knows what. And the bacteria that's in your body are there to digest and break down and consume and spit out particles based on what their species is and their strain. Some of them create gold, some of them create zinc, some of them create sulfur. I mean, it's all right down the line. And that is what their job is. Now listen to this. It says, um, high con concentrations of heavy, heavy metals like copper and gold are toxic for most living creatures. Not the case for bacterium C. metalluranus. Now, let's see where that is found and if there's any more that we can learn about this. So don't forget, this is a bacteria. Is it in humans? What does it do in humans? Well, yeah, here it is. This goes back to 10 years or so ago. The first case of human infection caused by C. metalodernus. Well, it's not an infection. It's the only first time they ever saw it. It doesn't do anything. It does good stuff. It says the abstract of this, and this is, again, National Institute of Health. All right, National Institute of Health, the U.S. National Library of Medicine. We describe the first case of invasive human infection, a non-socomial septicemia caused by C. metalodernus. This metal-resistant bacteria has not been reported to be pathogenic in humans or animals. It doesn't hurt you. They just never knew it existed. This guy had so many things wrong with him, and they played around with him for a few weeks, and he finally died. And, um, and they just happened to be digging through his reactions and so forth, and they found this bacteria, which was never really, I don't think, ever looked for, but I could be wrong. I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving you advice. I'm showing what I have turned up in my research, and it says it's not, not reported to be pathogenic in humans or animals. So my saying is that that particular metal dermis was the thing that created gold, which made gold from whatever toxic metals were in your body or in the mix of where that bacteria was. And it broke it down into another product, which is exactly what all bacteria does. It creates, just like they said, we have to take into account enzymes and catalysts. A catalyst is, a, is, is an enzyme. And the enzymes are created by bacteria. And when it goes out, an enzyme has a chemical, it's like a chemical bomb, and it goes out and it breaks down, destroys, or reacts, let's say, with other molecules and changes their structure, just like that, millions per second, and it doesn't even hurt itself. And it goes like a very, very, very fast invasion of what it is programmed to invade. And then they're all gone, and then when it's there, gone, he has nothing else to do, and then he goes. That's, the, that's how a catalyst and an enzyme works. It's very, very elegant. Okay, I've been talking about transition metals in the blood and, you know, how the blood moves them back and forth. And long ago, I had seen that blood was used in concrete. Long ago, in ancient Roman times, I'm thinking, well, what the blood going there for? 
it's the transition metals. They are the things that allow all the all the different molecules to bond stably. That's why rocks turn into I mean uh, flesh turns into rock, stone. Very stable, solid, solid as a rock. <laughs> and it won't deteriorate anymore because it is now stabilized using transition metals and all of the biology becomes all involved and locked together with the molecules to become stable. And that's why concrete is so strong using this ancient Roman technique. It's the blood, and it, but it's the transition metals. And this is the use of blood to make concrete. Excellent for kids. Make sure your probiotic gut health is, is, is the top shelf right now. Otherwise, I don't care if you get cured or get vaccines or whatever you do, that's fine. But you won't get, you get a lot better if you get COVID and you don't have good gut health because your gut health and the bacteria is what dissolves and creates and does all of the things in you to keep you healthy. So we talked about blood in the concrete and we're going to go a little bit deeper and then I'm going to be doing a video showing how they made the walls and the Inca walls and all these really fancy looking things they fit together. You can't put a piece of paper between. Well, let me tell you something. There's a lot of blood and tissue going on there, and you will see it in, the, in that video. Okay, so we're talking about blood in construction materials, and I claim that the reason it works so well in construction materials is because blood primarily consists of transition metals and then fluids called plasma. Now, the transition metals are these metals right in here that give and take molecules back and forth in a process called nucleophilic substitution. That means that it can take some of these and give some of those and give these and back and forth and give and take products out of your body and bring in nutrition and they remove carbon dioxide and bring oxygen in. That is how they transfer back and forth through these uh, transition metals. Now, what where are these found in the blood? They're found in the, the, the whole blood, but not in the plasma. Now, let's take a look at this. This is by the National Institute of Health. So they're talking about, and basically nobody really knows what is in the blood. This is a very simple study, and this is just brand new too, just a few months ago. Now, I, because I have so many videos on this, I've been working on interstitium and these fluid-filled bags and it used to be called areolar tissue, just membrane, flat membranes. Well, a while back they discovered there's fluid-filled bags in here. And these fluid-filled bags are where those bacteria live. They still don't even really fully understand the, the, the probiotics. They, they now understand there's a web in here. Yes, absolutely. And these are salty, fluid-filled bags. Yes, they understand that. Absolutely. They understand there's two types of collagens. Yes, they understand that. One of them is real floppy, the pink, and it just flops around. It can stretch this way and that way and do all this. The brown ones with the ball attached that locks them in place are the springs that make them return. After they stretch, they, they come back. These are the brown ones are getting broken from invasion of this particular uh, COVID. And they're breaking in, they're becoming fibers in the body, moving through this interstitial fluid because it's, it's not completely sealed in these bags. They have discovered that they, the fluids can move from bag to bag. The same fluid can move from here over to there tomorrow, the same particles. And they have found this due to looking into tattoos where they do it in this little tiny layer where they put the, these particular uh, metals and they can find them have moved through the body so they, they don't stay where you know they don't, don't move much I don't think but um, they were probably some form of a, a tattoo probably locks them somehow into the collagen but they still drift so that's the key we know that they can get away from these bags and move around and that's what happens I think these fibers break because the COVID attacks it. Now, why does it attack it? I'm not certain. Is it a chemical attack or is it a pH attack? It may change the fluid inside this bag no longer to be pH of a certain and it change the pH a little bit. And this particular material can't, 
can't ho can't do that. It's like putting bleach on something and they, it just breaks it. They they you understand what I'm talking about? It, it's it's an invasive something something invaded it. Let's just go with that. And this is a different collagen than that. This is the stretchy collagen, real floppy stuff. And this is the springy collagen. And then there's 28 different collagens. We got a lot of work to do to understand the human body and to because they didn't even know this existed three or four years ago. I knew it existed 10 years ago, but and I worked with people all over the world to try to understand this. And then it kept, I just kept developing. They, they're they happy knowing that the thing exists. I'm not happy until I know what it does, what lives in here, what causes this, why does this break, why does this stretch? What's up with this membrane? Well, the membrane is there to keep bad stuff out and let good stuff come in. Well, who does that? The bacteria does it. And how do they do it? There's ion channels, they call them. There's little channels that go back and forth here, but somebody has to open and close the gate. Those are the bacteria. And how do they do it? They do it with chemistry, basically. Well, everything is chemistry, first of all. They do it with specific, knowledgeable chemical processes. They know how to make the chemistry to do the job. They're like little chemists running around. They say, well, we need some zinc. All right, no problem. I'll take care of that. They go down and, and here's some zinc. Just like the gold guys. Well, I'll go eat some magnesium and turn it into gold. Whatever they do. And, and that's the only way I can think that all of the molecules in your body can become stabilized into a stable mix of what they call, um, you know, homeostatic, where it, it just doesn't change. It's like always the same levels of these metals do the same jobs. They have to do it over and over and over. If you don't have enough, you're going to be sick. If you have too much, that's another issue. But we have to find out what are, what are the metals, where do they exist, how are they created, what bacteria is involved. And we can easily do this just by comparison charts. See, these guys got all these different bacteria in them, and here's their metals. Here, these guys got missing this, 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 and this, and here's their metals. Sooner or later, you're going to draw some conclusions. Maybe there's no conclusions to draw, but that would be another conclusion. <laughs> Everything is a conclusion and once you look. You know, you may, it may not be a positive conclusion. It may be a negative conclusion. It may be nothing at all was understood, but the process of looking creates the conclusion that nothing can be understood at this point. And that's not the point forever. Because everything now is, is starting to be understood. And there's a lot that we missed. I mean, a ton. And um, we're going to see if we can figure out every, every little bit of it. But before we go anywhere, probiotics and the bacteria that live in these linings and these cellular compartments and these fluids are your immune system. I'm going to tell you right that right now. And they know this right now. And even if you start looking up COVID and um, probiotics, National Institute of Health, they'll say, well, you look it up because it's very simple to find it. So, and just look up probiotics and anything you want to look up because now everybody's associated. They understand, but they don't understand that it lives in these fluid-filled bags. So once you're... COVID attacks you and you're sick and then you get better, you still have all these broken things inside of you and you may never get better until you have your bacteria working here. And what will the bacteria do? First of all, it could keep you from getting more invasion. Secondly, hopefully there's a bacteria that will break these fibers into little bits and pieces, eat them up and make them so that once they're in that molecular form, they can be attacked and broken down. You don't want something to go back and break more of this stuff down. You want something to say, oh, I see that, and I'm going to go and, uh, and break that thing down. It's like, um, it's, it's like you removed everything out of its flexibleness, the molecules, and it's, it's a, an entirely new molecule once it's in its broken form. So a bacteria can create an enzyme that can break that down into bits and pieces of flesh out of your body. If you don't break them down, you're, you're, you're going to be sick. And that's what happens to these kids now. The kids are having these fibritic reactions. They're getting COVID toe, and their skin is getting all kind of problems. And that's because that's where your blood flows to the end of the little capillaries in your skin and then it comes back. Any little toes, at the end of your toes, the terminals and the fingers and the toes, and then it comes back. And that's where they're clogging up from the return. 
That's my take. Could be wrong. I'm not a doctor. I'm not anything. I'm just a guy with a big mouth, and I, that's all I do. Is, but I do re research. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm a moron. I'm out here trying to understand what I see as deep as anybody. If somebody wants to say, go, oh, Roger, you're just an idiot, well, they do all the time, but if they can back it up with something, I, I'll go with that. I'd like to hear it. Because all I ever hear is, oh, you just don't know what you're talking. You, should, yeah, you have to go to medical school to be able to talk about this. And that's what they did to me for a long time. All right, this is another thing I don't think they understand. I believe the blood plasma is really made by bacteria because look at what it says it's organ systems involved the origin of plasma which is not the whole blood it's the watery blood it constitutes 55 percent of the total blood it's interesting because no organ produces it where did it come from instead it is formed from water and salts absorbed through the digestive tract well how does it get absorbed but it's just flow through there by accident and are, is, what is, is blood plasma exactly the same in every person? Can we f indicate some form of, of um, problems? And you can, to some degree, I think, because these are the things that form in, uh, as plasma forms the liquid base of blood. Okay, as plasma forms the liquid base of blood, the functions carried out by the plasma overlap with the blood functions. A multitude of functions include coagulations, which is the fibers, that fibrin, and, and I've seen these in the mud fossils. I'll show you this in a second, and I'll show you the blood. And then you get into defenses and all these bacteria, virus, fungus, parasite, important role in the body's defense. And then it goes on, all these the nutrition, respiration, excretion, hormones, regulation, regulation, temperature, regulation, all these different things. And and if, they, if these different metals that constitute the whole portion of the blood or the plasma portion of the blood is not chemically correct, it's not going to have these function carried out correctly. Basically, it's simple as that.